We'd like to welcome everybody to this luncheon in this time of conversation. Thank you for, for making the time to come. Uh, just a, a few notes about how this event will work. Um, we, we've gathered here. We're going to start with lunch. So once we're through these logistical sorts of things in our introduction of our speaker, we'll go through the line and we'll start on that end. And then once you've picked up your lunch, you can find a spot at any one of the tables. And we hope that this is a time of conversation and fellowship and, and, and sharing with whoever is, is at your table. At about 12.15 or so, we'll draw people back here to the seats. And um, Susan will begin the, the more formal part of our, our presentation. Um, so I think in thinking about all that, we'll introduce Susan now so that when we shift from lunch to the presentation, you already know a, a, a bit about who she is. And if 12.15 comes and people are still eating, particularly your desserts, you can bring your dessert with you, your cup of coffee, your gl glass of water, whatever you would like to this portion too. So a few words about Susan Van Zanten. Susan is currently a resident scholar at the Collegeville Institute, and she will be with us through the end of this semester. Susan received her BA from Westmont College in both her MA and her PhD from Emory University. She is currently a professor of English at Seattle Pacific University. And prior to her position in Seattle, Susan taught at Calvin College, Baylor University, and Covenant College. She is the founder of the SPU Center for Scholarship and Faculty Development and directed the center for eight years. She speaks frequently to both academic and general audiences and regularly leads faculty workshops and retreats across the country. Although Susan's graduate training was in 19th century American literature, she also has done extensive research and writing in South African literature, faculty development and pedagogy, and Christian higher education. The author or editor of eight books, she has also published many essays and reviews in academic journals and popular periodicals. Her academic memoir and her most recent book, Reading a Different Story, A Christian Scholar's Journey from America to Africa, recounts how her research and teaching has shifted from American to African history, leading her to advocate for a global approach to education and scholarship. It also recounts her journey of reorientation and reflects on the challenges of being a Christian woman scholar. So we're delighted to have Susan with us on campus, and we're delighted to have her with us this afternoon. And um, we'll meet her shortly um, after lunch. But again, we hope that this is a time, this luncheon time is a time for you to meet some other folks on campus and, and to have an enjoyable conversation. So with that, we'll go through the line. And um, why don't we start with Janelle and Ward in the back. You can lead the way and find a spot at the table and then we'll come back at about 12.15. Well, please join me in welcoming to the podium Susan Van Zanten. Thank you, Carla, and uh, thanks to the Collegeville Institute for inviting me to do this, and especially thanks to the Collegeville Institute for letting me come and have these wonderful four months here on sabbatical, uh, reading, writing, walking, um, having great fellowship with the rest of the community. Uh, I've enjoyed it tremendously, and I'm in mourning or denial that I only have about a month to go. <laughs> Um, I'm going to start today with a sort of brief history, very brief, uh, about the fact that Christians have been reading poetry devotionally since the beginning of the, of the church, of course, in the form of the Psalms, uh, which were read, sung, and prayed, both in Jewish communities and the early Christian communities. Uh, then we have practices like, of course, Benedict's Lexio Divina and the Divine Office, promoted devotional reading of the scriptures with the divine office focusing on the poetry, notice my emphasis on the poetry of the Psalms particularly. As a part of the Reformation's emphasis on having worship in vernacular tongues, 
Uh, a lot of psalms were then translated into vernacular language and also metrical form so that they could be sung by congregations versus the previous monastic um, chanting of the psalms or intoning of the psalms. So psalms became, the, 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 the psalms started being transformed more into poetry in vernacular languages. <clears throat> in my own reformed tradition, Psalm singing has long been an identifying characteristic, and as I was growing up, every Sunday we sang a psalm. It was a regular part of the service, so I have sung all of the psalms repeatedly um, in my life. Um, and uh, with the spread of biblical translation, um, the, the psalms comprised in Renaissance English culture the most widely known poetic text. Hundreds of poets during this period began taking the psalms and adapting them, paraphrasing them, turning them into forms of poetry, uh, creating new forms of, po of devotional poetry that blurred the line between original poetry and translation. And there's hundreds of examples of this in the Renaissance, and one of the best known and one of my favorites is uh, um, Mary Sidney. Um, uh, who, who wrote a number of amazing versions of the Psalms from a woman's point of view in, in the Renaissance. Um, by the post-Reformation era, the devotional, uh, so I forgot that bullet point there, <laughs> adapted into Psalms. Um, by by post-Reformation era, the devotional lyric in particular had emerged as a major English genre. Um, in the devotional lyric, a lyric voice, which uh, speaks in terms of an I, goes through a process of working through uh, a set of spiritual concerns. So spiritual poetry, uh, scriptural poetry, the, for example, the Psalms turned into poems, and then the devotional lyric, I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute, um, are excellent candidates for reading poetry devotionally. But I think that there's, there's a lot of different poetic uh, genres that are capable of providing spiritual growth and that are, are good uh, candidates for um, devotions. Um, so I, I move beyond just the adaptations of the Psalms or devotional lyrics into kind of a broader category that I'm going to call devotional poems. Um, and devotional poems are poems which I'm going to define as helping us to grow in love of God and neighbor. So I'm going to describe one practice of reading devotionally. There's other practices as well. And the practice I'm going to describe draws on the, tra on the tradition of Ignatian meditation, but it also draws on some of the inherent qualities of poetry, because I believe that poetry is especially suited for spiritual exploration in many ways. Um, uh, you'll, you'll probably notice some overlap with what I'm saying with some practices of Lexio Divina. Um, reading, but reading poetry, is, I'm, I'm talking about it, is a slightly different kind of practice, I think. And one of the things I'm exploring while I'm here is how is it different, how is it similar from the practice of Lexio Divina. Um, so uh, more, more attentive uh, reading poetry devotionally, as I'm talking about it, I think is more attentive to the formal qualities of the text um, and more analytical, perhaps. Uh, than Lexio Divina traditionally is. <clears throat> so, while there's been numerous devotional practices employed since the days of the early church fathers and mothers, the spiritual exercises of uh, Saint Ignatius, uh, first published in 1548, outlined a particularly rich imaginative method of religious meditation. Um, in this process, thought is, directly, uh, is directed carefully to facilitate the production of emotions. Uh, so in other words, cognitive processes are used to produce effective results. <clears throat> and this is, of course, the same theory behind cognitive behavioral therapy that we use today. <laughs> that if you practice certain ways of thinking, that will affect how you feel. When we meditate, we think on heavenly things. The 17th century writer Joseph Hall describes that meditation begins in the brain and then descends to the heart. It begins on earth and then ascends to heaven. Ignatian meditation traditionally follows three steps. 
composition of place, understanding, and <clears throat> colloquy. Each of these three stages respectively corresponds to one of St. Augustine's three powers of the mind, memory, analysis, and will. The composition of place, and I imagine I'm preaching to the choir here, many of you probably are very familiar with Ignatian meditation. Um, uh, lots of my audiences are not as familiar with this. Uh, but in the uh, composition of place, we have an imaginative reconstruction that draws on memory of a physical place or scene. So if one were to meditate on the Sermon on the Mount, for example, one might imagine the sights and the sounds of the spot, the hot, dry air, the smells arising from an unwashed group of people, the clear but gentle voice of Jesus. And as we imagine this, we draw on memories of similar experiences that we have had, which is why we can imaginatively reconceive it. The imaginative composition is then subjected to the process of the intellect or the understanding. As one thinks or compares or contrasts or analyzes or does a number of intellectual kind of processes with this imaginative scene that has been recreated. Finally, the meditation concludes with a colloquy, an address either to God in the form of a prayer or to the self in form of an admonition or a resolution, I'm going to do this or I'm going to live this way or I'm going to do, um, try to this afternoon do this thing. Um, so the movement is from imagination to thought to application. In his landmark study, a book called The Poetry of Meditation, Louis Martz traces how this process of meditation operated as a fundamental organizing impulse in the poetry, in the British poetry of the 17th century. Martz shows how some of the best known devotional lyrics in the English language, lyrics such as John Donne's Batter My Heart, Three Person God, or George Herbert's The Caller, are formally constructed as meditations. That is, the beginning of the poem starts with a description of a scene, the middle of the poem works through thought and analysis, and the end of the poem ends in a kind of colloquy or prayer or address to God or resolution. So the, the poem itself, um, and that's the tradition of the devotional lyric, that it's, the poem itself is structured in that way. A perhaps less well-known devotional poet, but equally as brilliant, I think, is the late 17th century American Puritan minister Edward Taylor who wrote poetry as a devotional practice. Now this, you may think, is not the most typical Puritan practice, but it was one that faithfully and creatively drew on his theological tradition. Meditation was a key aspect of Puritan life, especially before taking the Lord's Supper, which the Westminster Shorter Catechism admonished was should not be taken unless you had gone through a process of meditation. The Puritan minister Thomas Hooker said about meditation, it's an exercise for two ends. The first to make inquiry of the truth and the second to make the heart affected therewith. Now as a Puritan minister, Taylor administered the sacrament of communion once a month in a small frontier village church. And in order to prepare himself to do this, he took the biblical text on which he would be preaching that Sunday and he composed a poem, a meditative poem, before he wrote his sermon. And this was the pro process of meditation he went through before writing a sermon, a more kind of reason-based, argumentative, um, analytical, um, public uh, document. His poems, called Preparatory Meditations, were only for himself and God. No one else read these poems during his time. They were not made public until in 1937, some enterprising scholar discovered a leather manuscript book in the Yale University Library, and his poems were made public at that point. So today, readers can follow his meditative moves as they read his extraordinary poetry. So if you look at your handout, <clears throat> just curious, how many of you have read Taylor before? Only one, okay. Uh, on your handout, the first poem is uh, one of Taylor's meditations, and he's going to be preaching that, that Sunday on the text, I am the living bread. That's his text. And here's his meditation on the text. Um, and I will say that I, I changed the spelling to be 
um, more, make it easier for you to read. <laughs> when that this bird of paradise put in this wicker cage, my corpse, to tweedle praise had pecked the fruit for bad, and so did fling away its food and lost its golden days, it fell into celestial famine sore and never could attain a morsel more. Alas, alas, poor bird, what wilt thou do? The creatures feel no food for souls e'er gave. And if thou knock at angels' doors, they show an empty barrel. They no soul bread have. Alas, poor bird, the world's white loaf is done and cannot yield thee here the smallest crumb. In this sad state, God's tender bowels run out streams of grace. And he, to end all strife, the purest wheat in heaven, his dear, dear son grinds and kneads up into this bread of life, which bread of life from heaven down came and stands dished on thy table by angels' hands. Did God mold up this bread in heaven and bake, which from his table came and to shine goeth? Doth he bespeak thee thus, this soul bread take? Come, eat thy fill of this thy God's white loaf. It's food too fine for angels. Yet come, take and eat thy fill. It's heaven's sugar cake. Now, can you imagine the difference between this poem and Taylor's rather Puritan sermon on the poem? Both provide opportunities for spiritual growth and formation, but this poem works in a completely different way. George Herbert once wrote, a verse may find him who a sermon flies and turn delight into a sacrifice. Poetry employs imagination and language in aesthetically pleasing ways. There's the delight. The imagination produces images, which need not be only visual. Poetic imagery can evoke any of the five senses. By the end of the poem, I hope you were imagining tasting the angel cake. Certain linguistic techniques create especially powerful and emotionally moving images. Techniques like simile and metaphor, onomatopoeia, metonymy, personification, all those things you learned back in your English class a long time ago. Now, we employ this kind of figurative language in all kinds of situations. Just listen to the sportscasters as they're speaking on Saturday during the game, and you'll hear lots of metaphors, similes, personifications, etc. We use that, this kind of language all the time. But poets use this language in a pervasive way. And they use it in such a way that it's highly co compact and compressed and elaborate. We must read slowly and carefully and repeatedly to unpack these riches. Poetry demands a lot of us, but it offers profound <coughs> rewards. Now, many poems also rely on sound, rhyme, rhythm, alliteration, assonance. The sound helps to create the meaning, and the sound also evokes the emotions. Poetry read out loud is a physical practice. It involves the breath, the tongue, the mouth, the vocal cords. We take poetry in, both with our eyes and our ears. We feel it. Formal poetic elements create new dimensions of both emotional and intellectual meaning. So I think it's important to consider those particular elements of poetry and to experience the formal qualities of poetry um, in our devotional practice of reading poems. Um, just very quickly, some formal aspects, and then we'll look at some poems, because I know that's probably more interesting than me talking. So some questions to ask when you read a poem. Who is speaking? Is it the devotional I, or is, it, is there someone else speaking? Who is speaking? Is the poem addressing someone? What kind of situation is the poem taking place in? Is it describing a scene, an emotion, a narrative, an experience? Notice that the Taylor poem went through this whole narrative. You know, the bird ate the wrong fruit, and then it was hungry, and they couldn't find any food for it, so then God um, 
served as a baker, and <laughs> then the bread came down. And people, it was a little narrative went through. So those kinds of questions about the poem. Secondly, the sounds of the poem. Always read a poem out loud, repeatedly. Uh, listen to its sounds and its rhythms. The words of the poem. Words have specific meanings, but also evocative meanings, denotative and connotative meanings, right? Words can provoke, evoke, stimulate certain kinds of feelings. And poets choose one word rather than another word because of the kind of emotional connotations that are with the words. Um, so the particular words, what would be changed if we took out one word and put another word in? Kind of the question you can ask. Imagery and metaphors, of course, of course very important. Um, the striking metaphors, a lot of poems use a lot of striking metaphors, and that's one of the things that Edward Taylor is known for, is his incredibly striking metaphors, the, the, the whole metaphoric construction of the poem that we read. Not every, not every poet uses a lot of metaphors. We'll look at a poem shortly that doesn't have very many metaphors in it at all. But what metaphors deepen its meaning? And then also allusions. Are there any aspects of the poem that refer to something else, a, something from a, another text, something from history, something from the Bible? Um, and what meaning does that kind of allusion add to the poem? So just to summarize before we look at some poems, one way to read poetry devotionally is to start by identifying and imagining the scene. We might call it the composition of place, the context. And then employing our understanding, historical, biblical, particularly I'm going to focus on poetic understanding. Um, and then thirdly, uh, making a resolution or application to ourselves in a colloquy. One wonderful resource for reading poetry devotionally is the book Drawn to the Light, Poems on Rembrandt's Religious Paintings by Marilyn Chandler McIntyre, who was here just a couple a month or two ago, reading her poetry. Um, and the handout, at the end of the handout, there's other, a couple of other suggestions. Um, but I, I really like uh, this book for reading poetry devotionally. The book pairs full color reproductions of paintings by uh, Rembrandt, religious paintings by Rembrandt, with poems by McIntyre. Um, the concrete physical details of color, line, shape, form, texture, composition in the painting help to shape our composition of place. So our composition of place, the, both the poem and the painting work together, um, kind of adding extra dimensions to that. And the poem definitely calls our attention to those elements. So here is Rembrandt's and McIntyre's um, The Return of the Prodigal Son. <clears throat> and this is on the second page of your handout. Um, as I read this, you might notice it doesn't have a lot of what you might consider traditional poetic qualities. It doesn't rhyme. It has very few um, metaphors. Uh, the poetic structure that works most predominantly in this poem is the use of whether a line stops or whether a line is a run-on line, if it keeps going. But think initially about the composition of place. That's not the best. You can't see that poem. You're, you're most, probably all familiar with that painting, I hope. Um, we would expect a close-up, father and son reconciled. We would emphasize the intimacy we've learned to invade, the father's painful, joyful gaze, the hand that draws his boy close to the very heart he broke, the young man's shame in the shadow of a half-turned face. The first stanza calls our attention to the foreground of the painting, what's um, most apparent, to the expression on the father's face, emphasized by the golden glow, outlined by the beard, of course, the predominance of the hands, you see the two hands pointing right into the center, um, uh, the, and the darkness of the prodigal's half-obscured face. All of those elements in the painting, the poem emphasizes. That's what we would expect to see. But there's more to the painting and the story, and the poem goes on to unfold that. The dark onlookers, and here the onlookers are extremely dark. You probably can't even see the third one there, there right? There's this one, and this one, and there's one back in there. 
you can see it. Um, the dark onlookers seem almost a mistake. They mar the tenderness of what would play so much better on the empty stage. How jarring to be reminded how little that is human is private. There are witnesses and judgments, costs and consequences. The painter insists on this awkward point. The father's forgiveness is not the whole story. The spotlight that illumines the two of them, their embrace, the very form of forgiveness, doesn't quite obscure the ones who stand and watch not quite so willing to receive the wretched sinner home. They're in the dark, but they're back there, and they're faint. They have accounts to settle, doubt about a change that seems a little too dramatic. They are men of common sense. Their judgments are just and cautious, all things considered quite properly skeptical. The young man will wear his past, a hair shirt, under festal garments. He will bear his brother's reasonable resentment and endure recrimination from those who make him a measure of their virtue, shielded in his shame by his father's blessing, girded with love for the hard labor to come. Notice how the father is almost shielding him from the three in the back as well, from the shame. Now, McIntyre uses poetic elements here very sparingly with great precision and detail. There's a lot of resonant alliteration in the poem. Reasonable resentment and recrimination. <laughs> very effective line. Um, earlier, costs and consequences. Hard words. Effective line breaks, that hair shirt under festal garments, I think is a particularly effective um, line break. Um, and then perhaps the image pattern of the girdle of love, it's girding, maybe there's a girdle of love, very, very, very subtle. But all this further advances the composition of place and I think the emotional heft of our meditation on the ideas in this poem. In Mending a Tattered Faith, Devotions with Emily Dickinson, I attempt to help readers encounter Emily Dickinson's poetry in this kind of devotional manner. This book reprints 29 poems by Emily Dickinson, and each has a question for the reader to ponder, followed by a brief reflection that tries to go through this process that I've just gone through. And we'll, we'll look at, well, at least one, we'll see if we have time for two poems. Looking at the, the poem's images, ideas, its composition of place, and looking at the poetic strategies that the poem employs to create certain effects. So um, again, on your handout, Dickinson's poem 978, one of my favorites. Well, I say that almost with every Dickinson poem. I, <laughs> my students keep saying, you, all, the, all the Dickinson poems are your favorites. But faith is the peerless bridge supporting what we see unto the seen that we do not. Too slender for the eye, it bears the soul as bold as it were rocked in steel with arms of steel at either side. It joins behind the veil to what? Could we presume the bridge would cease to be to our far vacillating feet? A first necessity. Now this is a much more difficult poem than um, Marilyn's poem, right? But I also think it rewards us in um, perhaps deeper ways as well. Think about the composition of place. Think about what you see from this poem. What's the first image that comes to you? Let's start with a picture. What? Bridge, right? It's a picture of a bridge, yeah? Um, 
And the poem starts by giving us this incredible metaphor, just right off, straightforward. You know, right from the beginning, we know this is a poem about a metaphor, and we have faith is a bridge. And then the rest of the poem describes the bridge. Okay? This is not a devotional lyric. It's not an I voice speaking. This is a kind of voice of a kind of, a, you know, almost dictionary quality. Here's the word. I'm going to, I'm going to define it for us. I'm going to define what faith is. What kind of bridge is described here? Any, what quality, what characteristics do you, do you see in this bridge? If you're envisioning, I mean, there's lots of different bri bridges, right? What kind of bridge is this bridge? Anything unusual about it? Well, no. It has no peers. It has no peers. <laughs> what does that mean? It's just, it's just floating. It has no support. Right? Okay, most bridges, there's the peers. See the peers in the bridge? Okay, this bridge doesn't have peers. It is peerless. What else can we say about the bridge in the poem? It goes from what we can see to what we can't, so it's very long. Okay, it's very long. It's very exactly, it's very long. It's disappearing in the distance and, and to, you know, unpacking the metaphor, one, half of, one side of the bridge is what we can see and the other side of the bridge is what we can't see. Somewhere, you know, so it's very long, it's off, it's in the distance, we don't know what's there, okay? What else about the bridge? It's very skinny. It's very skinny. <laughs> Too slender for the eye. It's so skinny that what? You can't even see it. It's invisible. Okay. Now we're getting a really weird bridge here, right? No supports, really long. <laughs> From what we can see to what we can't see. Um, so skinny, but you can hardly see it. What else? Well, it's strong. It's strong. Yes. How is the strength emphasized? Arms of steel, okay? It, it's, it might be long, it might be mysterious, it might be difficult to see. We, it doesn't seem to have any supports, and yet it's very strong and secure. Arms of steel. I think that this poem is describing a suspension bridge. A suspension bridge could be described as being peerless. It doesn't have peers. It's suspended from cables moored in the ground at either side, rather than having either Roman arches or piers are traditionally what holds a, a bridge together. Um, this is a picture of the first American extension bridge, which was built in 1855, and it was built over Niagara. Niagara, and it, it was the forerunner of its more famous cousin, the Brooklyn Bridge, which was built later. Um, Emily Dickinson knew about the, the Niagara Suspension Bridge, and it was a huge phenomenon in her time. How could you build a bridge that didn't have any supports? Now, the two arms of steel are the core, the, 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 the big cord, suspension cords that are holding the bridge in that you're surrounded by as you walk through. I thought, what an incredible composition of place that she's doing. And, and with this metaphor of this, she's conveying some things about faith. Dickinson loved puns. And we find one right away in the first line of the poem, the peerless bridge. I've suggested the peerless bridge is a suspension bridge. But the pun on peerless might also suggest that it is without peer, incomparable, without equal, precious, amazing. As a suspension bridge, faith stretches between what we can see on one end and what we can't see on the other, um, which is described with another great pun, the scene that we do not, S-C-E-N-E -E and S-E-E-N, what we can't see. Anybody getting any illusions here? Reference to another text? Faith is the yep, faith is the substance of things 
hoped for the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11, another definition of faith. Very faint, very faint illusion, but enriches the poem when you start thinking about that. The sentence begun, whoops, the sentence begun in the fourth line, notice, runs without a dash or a mark of punctuation into the second stanza to present this paradox of this slight bridge that's nonetheless as strong as seal, a steel, bearing the soul boldly and confidently. The bridge is almost personified, almost like an attentive mother. The arms of steel carry the soul and they rock it gently for comfort. And if you've ever crossed a foot suspension bridge, you know it does kind of rock a little gently. Think about that feeling in your body as you're crossing there. In line eight, we return to the scene that we cannot see, which is the other side of the bridge, where the stiffening trusses will tie the deck superstructure to the walls of the gorge. And what visually is here in the poem? What does the poem describe as being on this other side? <laughs> Say more. Okay, so there's a veil, right? What does that mean, that there's a veil? Well, I'm just thinking of Veil, Colorado, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't think it's Veil, Colorado on the other side of the bridge, no. <laughs> Uh, well, the, let's just, just start with the idea of we've got the suspension bridge, we have it crossing, we've got just, just the real concrete. What would the veil be? The what? Bank. On the other side. Can we see the other side? No. No. Why not? Why might you not be able to see the other side of a bridge? Fog. Fog. That's, uh, that's, um, that's a golden gate which frequently you can't see the other side of because of the fog, right? So a veil of fog. Um, you know, um, the bridal, uh, what is it, Bridal Veil Falls in Oregon? Um, is, is, there's so much water falling down, there's a veil of fog, so we use that. But you're right, and there's more to the veil than that. <laughs> what veil do we have to go through to get to the other side of the Bridge of Faith? Death. Death. Yeah, the veil of tears, the veil being ripped in the temple to allow us into um, going beyond the veil in the 19th century meant to die. And that's why there were all those mediums in the 19th century trying to reach beyond the veil. Um, so the veil becomes loaded with lots of, 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 of kind of meaning there. The temple veil was torn in two at the time of Christ's death. The book of Hebrews associates our hope of salvation with images of anchoring, strength, and veil. I'm going to read another passage from Hebrews. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters into that within the veil. Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This invisible bridge of faith mysteriously floats above the rapids. It carries us to a place that we're not, we haven't seen yet, um, but it will carry us securely. Now, thinking about faith in that way, feeling faith in that way, for me, opens it up in a new manner, which is what I think a devotional poem should do for us. I'll leave you to ponder or talk with a friend about how thinking about faith as a bridge might affect your heart. But we have a few more minutes to look at one last poem. One, one thing I want to say before looking at this last poem is that you'll notice, you know, it, the Ignatian, it, being a, a pre-modern person, Ignatius thought you could pretty easily divide these things. <laughs> but I've got an arrow going both that, that way and that way there. I mean, did you notice as we're talking about these poems, we move from the imagination to analysis and then from analysis back to the imagination. And analysis helps us, helps our imaginations grow and our imaginations tell us what to look at in doing the analysis. So it's not a clear, it's not a clear division. 
but I think both parts of that is very, are, are very important. So another Dickinson poem, very short one. Jesus, thy crucifix enable thee to guess the smaller size. Jesus, thy second face mind thee in paradise of ours. Context, voice, what's happening in the poem? Just very, very simply at the outset. What do you notice? What's the scene? We're going to create a little scene out of this poem. What would it be? Jesus on the cross. Jesus on the cross. And... Okay, do you, that thief, Jesus on the cross, the, the thief saying that, do you, you see the thief saying that, is the, is the thief speaking the poem? Who's speaking the poem? Who's the voice? The poem is being addressed to Jesus. So we might call it a prayer, prayer poem, right? It's being addressed to Jesus. Um, Jesus is being addressed rather vehemently, <laughs> twice. Jesus, exclamation point, exclamation point. So someone is saying something to Jesus. Now usually when people wear a crucifix, why do they wear a crucifix? I mean, notice the word crucifix. The crucifix refers to, right, the, the, the emblem of it. Whether on the wall or a necklace or whatever. Now normally, people, why do people wear a crucifix or why is there a crucifix? There isn't one in here, is there? It's kind of unusual. <laughs> okay, to show that they're a Christian, to remind them of Christ's sacrifice. Um, right? And what's the voice asking Jesus to do? <laughs> Remember, her. Remember her. It's completely reversing what we usually do with the crucifix, right? All right. Jesus, look at the crucifix and remember me. <laughs> the smaller size. The smaller size. The smaller size refers to what? The sinner. The sinner. Her own crucifix that she has borne, we'll say she, just because Dickinson wrote it. doesn't mean this is Dickinson speaking. I always want to caution people about that. Um, but the speaker of the poem says to Jesus, Jesus, your crucifix enables you, allows you to guess the smaller size, allows you to know what my small, my crucifix is smaller, obviously, than yours, <laughs> but allows you to know what pain feels like for me, the suffering that I feel. Second address to Jesus. Jesus, thy second face, mind, we might think of that as a remind, right? You know, uh, mind thee, reminds thee in paradise, when Jesus is in paradise, his second face, will remind us, will remind him of ours, of our what? Our face. Now what does it mean that Jesus has a second face? That sounds like a cubist painting or something, two faces. What's the resurrected face? Why would Jesus' resurrected face remind him of us? Okay, and Jesus, in what way does Jesus have two faces? He has his resurrected face and he has what before that? Div human and divine face. His resurrected face might be his, I don't know, his resurrected face is still his human face. It's just a transformed human face. 
right? But, but the idea that Jesus is both divine and human, and which part of Jesus' faces <laughs> will remind him of us, the fact that he had a human face, will remind him of us as well. Notice this isn't an I poem. It's an ours. Again, it's a communal kind of statement. This is what we as a body affirm. Each of the three lines opens by calling on Jesus urgently. And it tells Jesus two things. First, he said that he's reminded that the depths of his suffering make, him poss make it possible for him to know, give him the experience on which to ascertain our smaller pain. Jesus, uh, Dickinson uses the diminutive here, you know, the smaller size. She always likes to make, make things small. <laughs> so her cross is, or our cross is a smaller size. Um, and then we also, um, as, as you pick, picked up right away, we, there's an echo in here of the exchange between Jesus and illusion, between Jesus and the thief on the cross, who pleads, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus reply, reply I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. And again, the voice of the poem is just reminding Jesus of that exchange. <laughs> you see that? The crucifixion described in the first verse leads to the paradise in the second verse. And in both circumstances, Jesus is a tender pioneer, which is how Dickinson described him in another poem. Jesus is our, our tender pioneer. This is a poem I believe to that, well, I, this is a poem that I pray often in times of suffering because it reminds me that Jesus, through his incarnation and death on the cross and resurrection, became one with me in my suffering so that I could one day join him in paradise. Thank you.